Australia is one of the great wheat growing and wheat exporting nations of the world and it's only by the constant vigilance of wheat breeders that disease can be controlled and losses minimised. The earliest attempts to grow wheat in Australia were faced with failure due to repeated rust epidemics. These epidemics were extremely damaging and caused millions of dollars in damage. In fact, in those days, the wheat industry was pretty much unsustainable. Out of necessity, William Farrer began breeding wheat varieties that weren't inherently genetically resistant, but they matured earlier. It meant that rust epidemics were being experienced not one in every two or three years, but one in every 10 or 15 years. Rust is a disease of plants that's caused by a parasitic fungus. There are over 7,000 different types of rust that infect all kinds of plants. There's rust on coffee, so if you're a coffee drinker, you should be worried about that one. When it comes to cereals, there's rust on wheat, not just of bread wheat, but also the wheat that we use to make pasta from, durum wheat. There's rust that infects barley, so if you're a beer drinker, that's one to watch out for. And there's rust that infects oat as well. Following on from Farrer, Professor Waterhouse at the University of Sydney initiated rust research in 1921. Now that work led to the development of the very first genetically resistant wheat varieties. The first one of those that was released was Eureka, released in 1936. And at the time, great hope was held that the problem of rust in wheat was solved. But in fact, the pathogen changed and Eureka went from being resistant to rust to being susceptible to rust. I'm based at the Plant Breeding Institute here at Camden where my role is as director of the Cereal Rust Control Program. The main aim of the program is to help Australian farmers grow wheat, barley and oat crops that are free of rust diseases. And at the University of Sydney, these have been studied in detail for nearly 50 years. Research has been undertaken there, which has resulted in the breeding of resistant varieties. Many thousands of rows of plants are examined for disease resistance and other characters. Susceptible rows are mostly rejected as unsuitable for commercial cultivation. We've been working on this for a hundred years, we've made huge advances, but the problem is we're dealing with microbes that can change. Professor Waterhouse continued his research up until the mid-1940s when he was able to expand the work that he was doing through getting additional funding from the wheat industry after the establishment of the Wheat Research Act in 1947. This led to the appointment of new staff, one of which, Professor Watson, took over from Professor Waterhouse. Professor Watson purchased some land at Castle Hill, built his family home on it, and established a research centre. And some years later, that land was purchased by the New South Wales Flower Mill Owners Association of the Watson family and donated to the university in recognition of the work that Watson and Waterhouse had done in breeding rust-resistant, high-quality wheat. In 1973, there was a massive stem rust epidemic, an absolutely catastrophic stem rust epidemic. The epidemic was in the south, and it was fairly clear that wheat varieties being grown down there were highly susceptible. And so there was a strong push to develop a nationally coordinated wheat rust control program. And in 1974, that program was established and led by the University of Sydney. Not long after Professor Watson retired, and Professor Bob McIntosh took the lead of the national program. The program expanded in its focus to take in other crops such as barley and oats. And we also were faced with a new challenge. In 1979, stripe rust appeared in Australia. In 1988, I was appointed to the University of Sydney to lead the rust surveys for Australia. I started my career at Castle Hill. And not long after that, in 1991, the Plant Breeding Institute moved here to Coverty. One of the big things that changed when we moved to Coverty was the embracing of new technologies. So we were able to add a number of staff that relocated from the main campus to work very closely with us on rust resistance breeding and genetics, including people working in areas such as molecular genetics. So this was the initiation, I suppose, of us embracing newer technologies, and we've continued to do that ever since. In 2000, Professor McIntosh retired, and that's when I took over the leadership of the rust control program here at the Plant Breeding Institute. You'd think that after many, many years of working on rust pathogens of wheat, that we'd have the problem solved, but we don't. It's an ongoing arms race, if you like, to try and control these pathogens to keep one step ahead of them. That's happening in Australia, and it's happening overseas. There is a significant loss due to stripe rust in Pakistan. We are facing drastic loss due to this nasty rust. So we have to be fully prepared all the time so that if any epidemic comes, so we should have sufficient resources to fight with that. We've had tremendous impact with our work in Australia. 
We've also had some pretty amazing impact internationally, and a lot of that's been done through postgraduate teaching. Particularly noteworthy in that regard is Dr. Sanjaya Ranjaram, who did his PhD here in the late 1970s in Rush Genetics. And Raj, in fact, is considered by many people to be the most successful wheat breeder of all time. His work was recognised in 2014 when he was awarded the World Food Prize. This is like the Nobel Prize of Agriculture. I'm very excited about the next 100 years. We have an amazing group of young scientists who, like me, have had the opportunity to pick up on that 100 years, that amazing body of knowledge that we've generated over a long, long period of time. These young scientists have incredible skills, skills that I don't have, in things like bioinformatics and genome science. Through the tool of molecular biology, we are trying to identify new molecular markers to select rust resistance genes in wheat. Using this genetic engineering technology, we'll be able to better equip farmers with more effective wheat varieties, preventing rust incursions on farms. For example, in conventional process, it takes years to modify a wheat crop or any other crop, but with this CRISPR system, it, if it's working properly, then we can get our modified plant, say for example, maximum in one year with our desired results. I think with the gene editing and all these new technologies, in the next 100 years, we'll do a better job and we can do things much quicker than before. With, based on the knowledge we learned from the previous 100 years, of course. Yeah, you always need to build your knowledge up above the, the previous, um, like a stand on the, the shoulder of the giants. <laughs> and I believe they're going to use that 100 years of knowledge and those new methods to really take rust resistance breeding to a new level. This is going to be really important in future. We're dealing with things like climate change. We're dealing with a growing world population. We're dealing with dwindling resources. So food security is a big issue. It's going to become even bigger in the future. And we need to optimise the yield from staple crops such as wheat. These young scientists, I believe, are going to play a huge role in achieving that.